Welcome to Monticello Podcasts, where we look at various aspects of Monticello, Thomas Jefferson, and the work of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which has owned and operated Monticello since 1923. I'm Chad Wollerton, Monticello's webmaster. Quick question. Who wrote the United States Constitution? Did you answer Thomas Jefferson? Well, if you did, you're wrong. James Madison is most often described as the father of the Constitution, though several other people also played key roles in the development of the final document. In fact, Jefferson wasn't even in the United States when the Constitutional Convention was underway. He was more than 3,000 miles away, serving as the United States Minister to France. But the author of the Declaration of American Independence and of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom did have some strong opinions. This time we present three letters, two from November 1787 and one from the following December, in which Jefferson shared some of his earliest thoughts on the new Constitution. The recipients of these letters were John Adams, Adams' son-in-law William Stephen Smith, and James Madison. The letters, read by Bill Barker of Columbia Williamsburg, are presented in full in separate MP3 files on this website. There's a lot going on in them, so recently I sat down with Jeff Looney, editor-in-chief of the Papers of Thomas Jefferson Retirement Series, to get his interpretation of the letters and to provide some background. Well, I think these three letters are very uh, interesting in a variety of ways, but uh, obviously what makes them especially significant is that they are his first reaction to having seen the Constitution as it emerged from the Constitutional Convention. Uh, Jefferson is uh, part of an extended discussion among Americans at home and abroad, and he's uh, you know, engaging in dialogue at first uh, in these letters uh, with uh, diplomats abroad, with, with John Adams and Adams' son-in-law, uh, from whom he has received his first copies of, these, of this document. And subsequently, this is his first, first reaction to it, to his lifelong friend and collaborator James Madison, who, to whom Jefferson's opinion of the Constitution would have been especially important. Uh, he had several reactions, uh, some of them quite positive, but his, his objections uh, were mostly concerned with his, his fear of uh, uh, excessive government power. He was uh, deeply concerned mm -hmm. by the lack of term limits, uh, term limits in every instance, as he said, but especially term limits for the president. He felt that if the president could be reelected at four-year intervals, uh, he would basically uh, never stop getting reelected. I mean, he advances examples of that having been true in Europe uh, in recent and past European history, and he basically concluded that uh, the effect of this would be a de facto uh, monarchy, and that uh, that would mean European influence uh, in these elections because foreign powers would see how important these elections were and they would interfere. And the example he cites is that of Poland, where that's precisely what happened in the election of Polish, Polish kings. He was deeply concerned by the lack of a Bill of Rights, uh, which he felt that uh, all people, you know, people had a right to in every document, uh, no matter what. Uh, and he gives examples of what should fall in, in such a Bill of Rights, most of which we would recognize, but one of which uh, he repeats a couple of times, is that there should be provisions against standing armies, uh, which I don't think makes it into the final, final Bill of Rights. Uh, one particularly interesting thing is that he felt that uh, judicial review, I uh, didn't call it that, but he felt that judicial review should be uh, uh, brought in as well, again as a way to, in this case, limit, limit legislative power. Uh, in tandem with the president's veto would be some ability of the judicial branch to uh, react to and uh, control legislative enactments. That was an interesting one because you know, he becomes so against judicial review later on in his career, um, particularly when it comes to Marbury and Madison. He's sort of outraged at the claim for that. But that one occurs to me that, that the judicial review that's ultimately established is more final than what he might be proposing here, in that it would be more of a veto power. So it would be, it could be overruled by the same way a modern day presidential veto can be overruled. Um, so it wouldn't, they wouldn't be the final, right. final say, yeah. but it would also make that more likely to occur if it were just, I mean, if, if it, the judiciary had been given veto, we probably would have the judiciary 
putting in more often. Yeah, yeah. they'd be more involved on a regular basis, I think. That would have been interesting. Yeah, it would have been a very different type of judicial review, but that he was it, 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 disposed to speak to it in any way at all, I think, is, is quite interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, he was concerned that the, uh, uh, just generally with the tendency toward excessive power, and he, he's very much writing in the context of Shays' rebellion in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, in the context there was there had been a, a, an outbreak of, of a uh, popular uh, re revolution, which he basically regarded as not that big a deal, nothing to get too excited about, and in fact a healthy thing in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in any government. And uh, he felt that to avoid popular unrest, the answer is not more government power, but rather a better educated and informed public. And uh, so it's, it's quite a different view. Um, his solution to his concerns, uh, as he expresses it kind of in a tentative way here, but more directly in a, in a subsequent letter, uh, was that the uh, uh, no, he writes this back to uh, William Stephen Smith, one of the people he's writing to here. He says that if he were living in America, he would, he would support the uh, passage of the Constitution very strongly until nine states had adopted it. And then he would move over and just as strongly suggest that nobody else uh, pass the Constitution until they got a Bill of Rights. So he basically felt that uh, to save the advantages of the new Constitution, it should be brought into effect, but that uh, you know, four states should stay out until there was a Bill of Rights so that uh, that could be absolutely uh, guaranteed to happen. What was the precedent for a Bill of Rights at that point? Well, uh, it grows out of the English tradition, mm -hmm. where uh, it's uh, you know, it's an unwritten constitution, and the Bill of Rights is uh, 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 part of uh, what is implemented in the 17th century, uh, the Glorious Revolution, I think. Um, but it basically was uh, established several several rights, which would be uh, enacted against any or enforced against any subsequent government power. Uh, and in some ways it goes back to Magna Carta, although more the myth of Magna Carta in subsequent centuries than, than what it actually meant at the time. Right. But there was you know, the immediate precedent is the Bill of Rights that's enshrined in the, uh, the Virginia Constitution, okay. and uh, that's in 1776. So he, he felt you know, the Virginia precedent was very strong, and that's the, that, that, that's, uh, the version that uh, George Mason had, had basically written and enshrined in the Virginia Constitution. Um, one other interesting thing would be uh, the reaction of John Adams. Uh, to yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jefferson is writing. Some questions about that. And, uh, you know, I, I take a look at that, and Adams writes back to Jefferson, uh, and, uh, you know, he says, well, you are afraid of the one, I of the few. He says, we're, we're both in agreement that, uh, you know, popular rights need to be supported, but, uh, uh, he feels that Jefferson leans too far in being afraid of what the president might do. Uh, Adams, on the other hand, is very concerned about the Senate uh, becoming too powerful. Yeah. And he's especially concerned with the Senate having a role in the uh, appointment of offices. Right, the confirmation process. Confirmation that we made process. Yeah. He'd like to see a privy council, uh, kind of like the Council of State that was in existence in, in Virginia and other states at the time, but not uh, the, uh, the Senate and not an elective branch having, having a role in that, uh, which he felt would make them too strong. Uh, he also doesn't share Jefferson's concern about uh, the presidents being able to run for uh, re-election. Uh, in fact, he says, you are apprehensive of the president when once chosen, will be chosen again and again as long as he lives. So much the better, as it appears to me. Uh, he's, he basically feels that the president should be uh, very r rarely elected or re-elected because he's concerned about uh, the potential disruptive influence of, of elections. Right. Right. He wants fewer elections because he feels that uh, the potential for uh, foreign influence and other kinds of uproar are too strong when you hold any elections. So he says, elections, my dear sir, I look at with terror, uh, whereas uh, Jefferson feels quite the opposite. He feels that holding them frequently reduces their ability to, any, the, their importance. So any one election doesn't have the kind of right. cosmic influence that would lead to that kind of... It's so, funny that they both see the same boogeyman. Yeah, um, they do, yeah. but they have different answers. Just, exactly, yeah. exactly. Just, exactly. Just, yeah. Can I ask you about that? The, um, you know, the, the, the two had been friends for a long time mm -hmm. up to this point, and, and just a year and a half earlier uh, had spent time together in England 
traveling around. And then Jefferson kind of, when he writes this letter too, he just, he's writing about all these different things and he just kind of comes out very bluntly and says, so what do you think of the, of the new constitution? And then goes and really gives his response. It's almost like it's just a polite thing to ask before he gives his opinion. Mm -hmm. But it almost seems like this might be the very beginning of the rift between them. Um, that they all of a sudden kind of look and there's something very important at play now and they come to opposite conclusions about certain things, about the, especially about the presidency and about the power of the federal government. I don't think you were ever going to be able to uh, paper over this kind of fundamental difference mm -hmm, of opinion mm -hmm. they had on this. Uh, I do think it's a, a astute observation that in some ways this is the seed of what became a bigger and a bigger and a bigger philosophical mm -hmm. difference between them. Uh, and it certainly is fully in, in play by the early 1790s when Adams right. comes out with a, a book that uh, uh, is regarded widely as a strong endorsement of, of, of limited monarchy, which uh, Adams himself thought was grossly unfair. But it, <laughs> it's certainly true that he had argued that uh, uh, in the very much the same way that uh, the, uh, the concern against anarchy and uh, oligarchy was... Uh, uh, really the thing to be worrying about much more than uh, the executive. Uh, but I do think in some ways this is the beginning of what for quite a long time is a very uh, kind of tough-minded but respectful disagreement that they had. Right, I think right. they were they were perfectly able to uh, give and take in that without it becoming you know, deeply personal or problematic. Okay. And I think that's very much their attitude about each other right right into the mid-1790s when, when things took a more serious turn. Now, this um, the letter that Jefferson writes to uh, Colonel Smith, who is Adams' son-in-law, um, that one is interesting. He doesn't spend too much time talking about the particulars of the Constitution itself, but he does use the opportunity to talk about Shea's Rebellion and comes up with a couple of choice quotes. It's the, um, the Tree of Liberty quote. Does that quote haunt him um, in his, during his political career? It seems like a very strong statement to make um, and then to send right into a letter yeah. and hope that it never gets out. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how he felt about it. Maybe he thought it was one of the smarter things that he'd said, but it is something that's, um, that is kind of a disturbing image. Well, it's a, it is a very strong image, a very strong statement. Uh, he repeats something like that a couple more times mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. around the same time. Uh, I don't know, I don't think it actually became public knowledge okay. until after he died, uh, but it's certainly one of any number of very outspoken uh, statements he, he makes at various times throughout his career. It's probably one reason he's very concerned not to have his name actually put in front of some of the things he says. Right, but, right, right. Uh, there's a different version of the letter to Adams that he sends to uh, Uriah Forrest a few days later that, uh, you know, it's, he, he basically with a with some some in a few a few important changes but he basically says i just finished you asked me my opinion of the constitution i just sent it to mr madison so i'll copy that to you so he he copies it to him and it's verbatim the same in many places but there are a few important differences this is okay, so this is a letter to adams or to madison i'm sorry this would be the letter to madison right? okay madison okay uh, but in that letter he uh he says at the end uh, of his you know introduction to this long extended quote from the madison letter um that uh, he, uh, this man Forrest can make what use of it he likes, except that he wants his Jefferson's name kept out of it. <laughs> um, so you know, he says, "Go ahead and use it, but don't you put can, my name on you it." You can quote me, uh, but don't you know, don't assess me with the quote. Yeah, and I think you know this is part of a, a you know, very long, lifelong attempt to uh, avoid getting into too much trouble with some of his more outspoken uh, formulations. And and yet it. feeding some good language, or what he thinks might be some good arguments uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, that support his beliefs. Yeah, well the letter itself, uh, the letter to Forrest, has a, a, a great summary of Jefferson's views of the Constitutional Convention, <laughs> uh, the people in it, and uh, you know the kind of mistakes that he thought they'd made. He says, I suppose I see much precious improvement in it, but some seeds of danger which might have been kept out of sight of the framers by a consciousness of their own honesty and a presumption that all succeeding rulers will be as honest as themselves. <laughs> you know, he basically says that uh, you know, these guys are maybe a little bit too uh, sure that everybody will be as uh, 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 righteous as they are, uh, <laughs> and that they might have missed some stuff that way. But, you know, so in effect, he's saying they might have been a little naive. Naive. <laughs> uh, but in, in a much more polite way. That's funny. Yeah. The, um, I, another thing about the, um, 
the letter to Smith that, that is interesting, because he repeats this in the letter to Madison, is that calculation that he does about the frequency of revolutions. And it's, it, it's, it strikes me in two ways. First of all, it's just Jefferson's penchant for calculating things, uh, especially when to us sometimes they seem like mm, it's kind of strange. But the other thing, too, is that when he makes the calculation, he counts each state mm -hmm. yeah. as its own country. So it really does... Kind of cheating there. It's think. a little bit of cheating, but it also then shows that he's not completely of the union. He's, yeah. He still thinks that states are their own entities, their own sovereign entities, and that the union is just sort of a, an agreement among gentlemen in many ways. Well, until, until the Constitution is enacted... Uh, he's within his rights to think in those terms. Well, that's I mean, true. The Constitution, the Articles of Confederation are perpetual, but they still don't really unite a single nation in, in the way that the Constitution does. So I think what he's really up to there is to, uh, you, know, you can certainly use the calculation that way precisely because uh, he still isn't completely convinced that this is going to have work, the yeah, effect right. that it ultimately does have. Right. So, of taking the states and turning them into a state and nation. Now, with the letter to, to Madison, he spends a little time, as he does with, with, uh, with the letter to Adams, going about some business uh, before jumping to the information about the Constitution. And here again, it's kind of funny because be while well, before he said, you know, he just kind of bluntly asks uh, Adams and then launches into his own thoughts about the Constitution. Here he kind of subverts his speaking about the Constitution at all saying it is as it's a I've got nothing else better to write yeah, yeah he basically says let me fill up the page because I don't have anything else to say so right so I'm yeah. tossing some comments on the Constitution exactly what should I talk about let me yeah. see well what can I think oh the Constitution and of course um, that's that's disingenuous or, <laughs> or a polite you know, evasion whatever way you think of it sure but, but I think it's very clear that what he's doing there is uh, he's being diplomatic in two senses of the term. Yeah. He's, he's being diplomatic in the sense that he is a diplomat, a United States diplomat at the time, and he knows his role is not to um, be part of this process. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got to be apart from it. So I think that he's uh, distancing himself from the kind of advice he's giving because he is a, he's a minister of, of the state. Right, uh, and not right. somebody who ought to be commenting on these in a way, in a, in a specific way. Uh, but it's also diplomatic in the sense of uh, uh, you know, not kind of coming to the main point and saying part of the main point is that you, know, you my friend, have come up with a document that I think is deeply flawed in certain ways. Right, right. Uh, so that he can kind of make it more casual by not starting out with uh, you know, saying, what on earth do you think you were doing? <laughs> saying rather, you know, that... Uh, and of course, that's also how he, how he starts out by saying the many good good features he sees in the Constitution. Yeah, and he ha and he has some wonderful language for it, too, especially the be. the yeah. captivated uh, yeah. when he's talking about the uh, the House and the Senate and the, the vision of uh, representation there. Yeah, but to Madison, unlike the one of the other letters, he does not say, uh, uh, "Well, you know, what we could have done just as well by keeping the good old uh, Articles of Confederation and making a few yeah. choice amendments." Uh, right. Uh, which is kind of how he ends one of his letters. He That's right, he does. Why doesn't does. we just kind of leave leave that as it was and preserve it as this kind of sacred relic? Uh, and here he says, he doesn't go into that, but he does um, make the more substantive points that he thinks are more important. Right, right. I've got one last question for you, because there, there was a phrase that struck me, and I want to see if your thoughts about this agree with mine. Mm -hmm. It's in the letter to Colonel Smith, and he's talking about um, I guess he's talking about the, the, the Constitution and uh, probably the, the strong presidency, and likens it to setting up a kite to keep the hen yard in order. Mm -hmm. First thought, of course, when I heard that was a kite, like you know, flying a kite. Talking about a bird. Talking about a bird. Yeah. And so this is a bird of prey. A bird, right? Right. So he's basically saying that uh, to uh, to solve a uh, a problem, we're creating a much greater problem. Right, putting the fox in charge of the hen house, essentially. Yeah. Had you yeah. ever heard that phrase before? No, but it, uh, it's a nice and colorful phrase. It truly it is. A, and in this context, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but absolutely. It's one of, uh, I don't, we could probably figure out uh, that he's quoting a, a fable of some sort. Hmm. Okay. Uh, it could be Aesop, but it could also be, who's that, there's a French guy, Fontaine maybe? There's a, there's a French guy mm -hmm. whose fables are, 
very much uh, uh, in use at the time. Okay. But I suspect that it wasn't something he came up with. I think it was a, a kind of a metaphor in popular usage. Right, right. There's a, there's a, later, there's a letter that uh, I helped annotate a long time ago where Gouverneur Morris, uh, in writing about a later stage of the French Revolution, is uh, uh, talking about King Log. And this is uh, uh, an Aesop's fable where uh, the, uh, I think it was the frogs who uh, uh, clamored that they wanted a king and uh, Zeus gave them a log, log. <laughs> and uh, the log uh, didn't satisfy them. You know, the log just sat there doing nothing and so then he let them have uh, some predator who proceeded to gobble them all up and he said, you know, what you want is a figurehead. Right, right. Uh, that's his point. <laughs> the, the, the point of the fable is there are contexts in which a figurehead is what you want exactly because right, right, something right. with actual power is more dangerous. Uh, that kind of thing is uh, comparable to what I think we're talking about here. Okay, that's great. Yeah. All right, well, thanks. Okay, thank you.